Uh, my name Benny Lee. You know, I was born the name Benny Lee. You know, they wanted to name me after my father. His name is Benjamin Franklin Lee. He hate that name. But they call him Benny Lee. So my mother said, well, since they call Kenneth Kenny, uh, they named me Benneth and called me Benny. So that's how I got the name Benneth Lee. But people know me as Benny Lee with a Y. I argue with people, they want to spell it B-E-N-N-I-E. -E. When I was young in grammar school, there was a girl in my class named Benny also. She spelled hers I-E, so I'm stuck with Y. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm glad to be here. Anytime I'm actually coming in front of people that want to do anything to kind of improve uh, what's going on in our society, I'm more than glad to add my two cents. You know, Martin Luther King, he believed that uh, some of the problems that we see today in the world, in society, has to do with the three evils of society, what he called. Right? Militarism, war, poverty, and racism. <clears throat> he said, as long as we have racism in our society, as long as we have poverty, as long as we have military war going on, we're going to see crime and violence. Does that make any sense? Right? Anyone agree or disagree with that? Right? Then he said that every human being should be entitled to what he calls the wealth of the earth. That every human being should be loved, should be treated with justice and with equality. So having that spirit, he believed in building a beloved community wherever you go. So for me to say I'm going to build a beloved community wherever I go, any person I interact with, I'm going to interact with love. And through the conversation, the dialogue, debate, or whatever, I'm going to look for the justice in it all. And then I'm going to look at everyone that's equal and having equal opportunities. That makes sense. And this is what he believed in building the love of community. Uh, I've done uh, my own personal research on conditions uh, in the community in which I come from. Uh, really come out of Ohio. I was born in Painesville, Ohio, right outside of Cleveland, Ohio. It's a small little town right outside of Cleveland, 20 miles from Cleveland. And I moved to Cleveland when I was five. And uh, they, they, they said that uh, if I can count to 100, I can skip <coughs> kindergarten and go straight to the first grade. My mother said I got to 90 and just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so they ended up allowing me to go to the first grade anyway. And I remember being uh, in a, uh, like a poverty stricken area in Cleveland. Five, six, seven, eight, because I left Cleveland at nine years old. Uh, we didn't have grass in front of our houses. And even at that age, we used to fight, have rock fights with guys on the next block. Right? Because we would meet at this juncture at the store that everyone had to come to, you know. And when we met, these guys were from the next block or the guys across the other side of Sinclair Boulevard. It seemed like we were like looking at each other as part of different groups, you know. And that's how I uh, uh, studied this whole issue around street gangs and how street gangs form. Are y'all familiar with any of the work from Frederick Thrasher? He wrote a book where he researched 3,010 gangs in Chicago. This was like in 1927, around the same time uh, when the uh, Chicago Era Project came into existence. Studying, that's where that term subculture comes from studying the behaviors and the life of a juvenile delinquents. That's where that term subculture comes from. Right? And Thrasher believed that gangs are formed through conflict. And I believe that because when I look at how we became a street gang, it was through conflict. You know, uh, when I moved to Chicago in 1963 in K-Town, and you all familiar with the K-Town era in Chicago? Right, that's that era between Pulaski and Cicero, all the streets start with a K, <laughs> right? But K-Town is pretty much between like Roosevelt Road and say Lake Street, that's considered K-Town. That was like a black community during that time. And they gave it the name K-Town, the black street, right? And you had the K-Town Cobras, that was a large street gang back in the 60s in K-Town. Then you had the Vice Lords, Right, the imperial chaplains. But when I look back in that time, me being young, out of Cape Town, that's why I just moved to in 1963, uh, a lot of conditions. You know, we had to 
uh, fight over certain space at the playground and to the school, all, that, all these conditions, a lack of resources cause us to be in conflict with each other, right? Uh, we were what you call seven hoods, me and six other guys. We were seven hoods. Uh, we was nine, ten years old, you know. Uh, Frank Sinatra, the Rat Pack, had a movie in the theater called Robin and the Seven Hoods. So we became the Seven Hoods, right? And we used to fight guys on the next block, the Gladys Boys, the Monroe Boys, the Warlords, right? But we were all like nine, ten years old. So we had this thing of protecting our own, right? But it was based on turf, right? And so around 66, 1966, I moved out of Cape Town to the Austin area. That's like 4700 West. You know? And we were like in the 4900 block on Jackson. And we were like one out of three black families living on Jackson. And when we went to school, it predominant another ethnic group. And we were like the minorities. But we had to fight them just to get through the neighborhood to get to the school. And we had to fight them when we come out of school to get back home. Then in the summertime, we had to fight them to get to the nearest swimming park, right? And so that forced us to band together, right? France Fanon, any of y'all familiar with some of the works of France Fanon? He wrote a book called Wretches of the Earth. And he talked about how you get an oppressor, a group that oppressed people, and he got an oppressed. And he talked about how when the oppressor oppresses a group of people, that restrict them from opportunities, then the oppressed try means of fighting back. But they find their means of fighting back are ineffective. And sometimes those means can be legally, politically, and those are ineffective means to fight the oppressor back because the oppressor pretty much controls that political system and the legal system and the economic system. And so at the same time, the oppressor used violence also to keep the oppressed oppressed. And so the oppressed try to fight back, and then it was the oppressor that teaches the oppressed how to become violent. And what happened, the oppressed serves moves out the picture, and then the oppressed start oppressing each other. And I've seen that happen when we moved into the Austin community. We were fighting other ethnic groups to go to the nearest movie theaters and to the parks and swimming. And uh, our families fighting over you know, housing, uh, fighting over employment opportunities, right? And so when the other ethnic groups moved out and other blacks moved in, then we start fighting each other over the same resources we naturally was fought other ethnic groups over in the beginning. And that led to black on black crime. And then we banned together and we became street gangs. That makes some sense. Those conditions. And how do that look today? So let me uh, stop and see if any of you got any questions on what I covered so far, or anything you feel you can pull from me while I'm here today. Anything you feel you need, I need to focus on for your sake while I'm here today. Anybody? Question on what I covered, or something you feel you want to hear from me since I'm here. This is your last opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, I want to turn this around because I can't see behind me. All right. Talks about the crippling of economic impact of the Great Depression of the black community. How many of y'all did some research on that Great Depression during the 30s of blacks migrated from the South to the North? And y'all did any research on that? We just came out of the 100th year anniversary of the 1919 race riot. You're familiar with that 1919 race riot that happened here in Chicago? Where did that actually happen at? Who, who recall what era in Chicago, where did that actually happen at? Where's that place at right now today? 31st Street Beach. That was a community called the Black Belt. Today it's called Bronzeville, but then it was called the Black Belt. And why was it called the Black Belt? What do a belt do? 
whole day together, right? So blacks couldn't go east, or couldn't go west of Wentworth. That's where the Dan Ryan Expressway is made. Blacks couldn't go west of Wentworth. They couldn't go north of 27th Street. And they couldn't go south of 47th Street. So it was locked into that box right there. And because of overcrowdingness of blacks moving in that area and trying to go across Wentworth and going further north 27th Street and further south, it brought tension between the surrounding communities. And it was predominantly the Irish community. It was a, 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 a large Irish street gang called the Reagan Coats. Have y'all heard of that name, the Reagan Coats? Well, there was a county commissioner named Frank Reagan that kind of organized these young Irish street gangs. And they opened up what they called SACs, social athletic clubs. So they were considered the Irish gangs, SACs, not gangs. But they were labeled blacks as gangs and uh, Italians as gangs and Jewish as gangs. But the Irish pretty much dominated the politics in this country. <coughs> Right? And they played a major role in that 1919 race. <coughs> and there was another Irish game. Uh, uh, they had a sack called the Hamburg Athletic Club. Any y'all the name of that? It still exists today. Mayor Daly, the father, he was a member of the Hamburg Athletic Club. He rose to become the president of the Hamburg Athletic Club. Uh, if you do research on his political career, every election he went in, Somehow, his opponent mysteriously died every election. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they were pretty much the dominant gangs in Chicago in the Irish. They dominated the Italian gangs, the, the Mexican gangs, the Jewish gangs, right? And during that era, you didn't have black gangs, but blacks were migrated from the south to the north and trying to come across Wentworth. Right, and as time went on in the 40s, going into the early 50s, Mayor Daly by that time became the mayor. Right? And then what did he do? To contain blacks, right? He built the Dan Ryan Expressway. It became like a border. And then he built all those housing projects and shot blacks up in the air. And then there was another black community forming on the west side near Roosevelt and Halstead, Troop Street, right? And blacks were trying to go north of Roosevelt, right? But then that was predominantly like a German, Italian community. And they built housing projects that had shot blacks up in there. They called it the village, <coughs> right? And then you had a lot of blacks moving on that Lake Street border, Lake Street, right? And to prevent blacks from crossing Harrison, right, they built the Eisenhower first. And then they built the Henry Horner Housing Project. And then the Rockwell Project further west from Western to contain blacks. And because of these conditions, overcrowdedness, and limited resources, right, you saw a lot of violence and crime. Even today, when you study the six communities in Chicago that, cause, that you see most of the crime and violence at, right? When you look at the conditions of those communities, you look at social disorganization, you look at autonomy, right, the restricted opportunities, this is where you find most of your crime and your violence at, right? And most communities where there's homeowners, you see the limited crime and violence, but those transit communities where people rent from, that's where you see most of your crime and violence. This makes some sense. Right, so in reality, like Martin Luther King said, poverty creates crime. Poverty creates gains. Poverty creates violence. As long as we have poverty, right, we're going to have this. Right? So the, the gang members and the, the, and the criminals is not the issue. The issue is the conditions. Right? It's the conditions. Like in our case, when we moved in Austin, it was a predominant uh, white community middle-class community. And what was in Austin? You had the, the uh, Zenith. Zenith was the top of the line company that sold TVs and stereos, right? And Motorola. All this was in Austin. Uh, Brock's Candy Factory was the largest candy company in this country. 
in Austin, right off Lake Street and Kilpatrick. Right, Western Electric hired thousands of fathers right off Cicero and uh, Cermak. Right, so you had all these companies and job opportunities. Lake Street had nothing but factories down Lake Street, but America really was producing things, right? And so you see a lot of uh, people living okay, being able to live up to the norms of society, right? And uh, you didn't see a lot of this violence and crime. And then as blacks start moving into those communities and then those companies start shutting down, now you go in Austin, now think of one place in Austin that can hire 10 fathers at one time. Right? Like you look at, for example, uh, 4700 West on Jackson. The first building on that block is 4700 West Jackson. You go to the corner of Cicero, 4749, 59 West Jackson. So that's 59 buildings on one block. And most of those buildings are two flats. So that's two families to a building. That's 118 families on one city block. And then some of those buildings are three flats. Well, that's six families living in one building. Right, but if you limit it to 118 families on one block, and then the next block, Gladys, same thing. Next block, Bamboo. So on the four block radius, you, know, you add that up. Right? But then there's no place for people to, 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 to work, no employment opportunities. And then you look, where's the actual grocery store in Austin? There's not a Jewels, right? Brown Cicero, from the Eisenhower. To Chicago Avenue from Kilpatrick, which is 4600 West, to Austin, which is 6200 West. There's not even a Jewels or grocery store around there. Right? And there's one high school, Michelle Clark. So these conditions is causing tension among those young people. Right? And then who do they see come back home from college? Their older brothers, their other siblings come home from college with degrees come back, where can they take this degree and build a career for themselves and in that area? I teach at Northeastern University, and uh, that's when a lot of the shooting was happening in, in Austin. And I asked the students that actually lived in the community where the shootings has happened to do the survey. I didn't want students that didn't live <laughs> in the community to do the survey, right? Because the survey was based on your own recollect, your own experience having to walk from home to a store, from home to school, what you face with, that's what the research is based on that. So it didn't make sense for someone that never lived in that type of environment to do this survey. I'm gonna make some sense there. And so what they came up with, the average shooter was between 15 and 25. And predominant young black male and didn't have a high school diploma or was struggling in school, right? So they kind of profile who the shooter is, right? And we took it a little further. Let's look at what's going on in this person's life prior to them becoming the shooter. So let's look at elementary school, right? family setting, community structure, right? So now we can predict if a person lives up under these conditions and this type of family structure and these circumstances, and they're going to become a shooter, that we can look at how do we prevent people from becoming shooters and we'll make it successful. And this is just something that little old me came up with. Do you think the law enforcement get that type of understanding technology where they can do that same type of research? Some people got their research and they see this. But what's happening? What are we doing really to prevent it? You know, yeah, if you want to lock them up, and that's just a symptom. Right? But what's causing all this here? Until we address these issues, right? until we address these issues, we're going to continue to have these problems. Right? We want to punish the symptoms. We want to punish, as Martin Luther King said in one of his principles of nonviolence, we need to attack the forces of evil, not the person doing it. Because there's some conditions, there's some circumstances that cause the people to act evil. The person is not really evil. Right? So let me pause here if anybody got any comments or questions. Thoughts? Y'all are quiet. You're nervous. <laughs> you know, I get nervous when I'm around a lot of quiet people. That means you're plotting on me. <laughs> Seriously.
I've been in prison. I served time in state field maximum security penitentiary. And you, you, you got to be conscious when people are quiet. They <laughs> quiet. Um, I guess just for me, I'm kind of curious about what ways you think there are for people to actually like take back power or like take up space and have kind of, like political power, or other types of power. Um, especially existing like in the system that you mentioned. So just like what are some of the concrete things that can be done, if anything, within the system and then uh, even to help like dismantle it going forward? Well, the power is in the people. Like they say, we the people. Or even a person that's indicted for a crime, they say the people of the United States of America versus that person. The power is in the people. Right? So it's Really has to, like what my, uh, Dr. Collins G. Wilson in his writing, The Miseducation of the Eagle, he quoted, uh, if you can control the way a man thinks, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to tell him to go here, go yonder, go around the back, right? He will go on his own. If it's not a back door, he will carve one out for a special place because he's been trained to think that's where he belongs. So we got to do uh, like a conscious raise, you know, we got to raise some conscious. You know, like Harriet Tubman said, she could have freed more slaves if people only knew that they were slaves. So people looked at slavery as a way of life. It's natural, it's normal. Right? But then there was those abolitionists that recognized that's not normal. Right? So once we start raising people conscious, like young brothers and sisters in these communities that's involved in crime and violence, whatever, this is like the norms. You know, because here I am. Six, seven years old, and I heard about somebody got their coat taken or their bike taken. What am I premeditating in my little mind? What am I going to do if someone try to take my bike or take my coat? So I'm forced out of these conditions to stop thinking about it. That makes sense. Right? So I'm premeditating about it. So when it happens, I'm going to automatic pilot. I'm going to act pilot. Right? In prison. Right? Uh, I know when I, before I got to prison, I heard a lot about prison. The raping going on, the molestation <laughs> going on, the abuse going on. Right? So when I got to prison, where's my thinking at? How am I going to defend myself if I get approached? So these circumstances cause me to think like this. Right? And so being young, going to prison, yeah, I got caught up in riots. I got caught up in a lot of battles in the prison. But when I got older, and I started realizing, <coughs> we in this county jail, 40 of us on the deck, and there's only one TV up there. <coughs> and it's 40 personalities. That one TV will cause conflict among us. So being in a leadership role, I said, let's cut that TV off. And that's dialogue about a schedule for the TV that we could all agree to. But it took courage for me to stop that, because you got other games on that deck. I wasn't that chief, right? But let's talk about that one team you had set up to cause us to have conflict among each other. Let's talk about these two benches that are going to sit maybe six people, and there's 40 of us on the deck, and everybody wants a chance to sit on the bench. That causes conflict. So how can we coexist here? And state here, maximum security penitentiary, there's over 2,000 inmates, right? But there's only 110 jobs in the whole prison setting, right? And then there's 80 slots for people to go to school, okay, for 80 people go to school at a time, but there's over 2,000 inmates. And the majority of us didn't complete high school trying to get a GED so we can come out a better function in society, but these conditions are penetrating together. So how do we uh, uh, recognize all these conditions and set up a system among ourselves that we can't rely on the administration to set it up? So how do we have game meetings to talk about how do we not allow these circumstances cause us to be in conflict with each other? That's something we have to do for ourselves. Good example. Last time I was in Stateville, you know, I started seeing a lot of young guys coming down, 18, 19 years old, and they had that same look in that eye, that same fear that I know me and my peers had when we first hit the penitentiary. Right? 
So they would call home and they would, because uh, uh, these are like the sons uh, of some girls I went to grammar school with. And they would call home and tell their mama they met me. And their mamas would call me to the phone and say, Billy Lee, look out for my baby. Their grandmamas would call me to the phone, Billy Lee, look out for my baby. I remember when I used to allow you to sit on my porch when you used to run from the police, look out for my baby. So I started feeling a sense of responsibility to my community. Right? So my thing was like a mandate to these young guys. If you don't have a high school diploma, you need to enroll in school. If you have a high school diploma, take advantage of some of these trades, right? Because see, as vice lords, we, we had an oath we took. Right? And part of that oath is we were served our time constructively so that upon our release we become a more productive member of our community. <laughs> so now I'm pushing this oath. Right? And these little guys, I don't want to go to school. I ain't going to school on the street. I said, well, I tell you what, little brother, that name you claim, that's my name. I can take that from you. You own your own. But they didn't want that. So they had to jump in line. But then when they tried, then that's when we realized there's only 80 slots for people to go to school in that whole prison system with over 2,000 inmates, right? And there were about 110 jobs, right? So the stronger gang trying to dominate the weaker gang over those resources. Same thing happened in the community. You got non profit wars going on. It's only a pot of money to do non violence work on that pot of money to gain and eventual work, and these novel pipers are fighting over those grants. And they have war with each other. Y'all probably right see it. So here we are in prison, saying the same thing. The stronger gang trying to dominate the weaker gangs over the resources. Right? And so we tried talking to the administration to shed light on the situation. And at the same time, raise the brothers' conscience. These conditions causing me to look at you like opposition, causing you to act like you're acting me to look at you like that, right? And we can't allow that. What if I can ask you, you said that it took you some courage to be able to speak across lines, that it took you getting a little bit older, but was there anything else that helped you personally build that courage to talk to other people? We have a lot of projects that work with young men that aren't always willing to engage with each other for different reasons. And one of the things that we concern ourselves with is how to maybe change their mindsets around that. Well, the first thing is, you know, get your facts together. You know, get your information together. Get your facts together. Before I talk to you about a situation, I should do my own research, the facts. So when I do speak with you, Right. Get the facts. Once I've done and got my information, then it's only to educate others, to bring that awareness up. And that's what we did in the prison setting. Once we became conscious of what was going on, we started educating others. Like when Mayor Washington was running for mayor, we did a campaign in the state the of maximum security penitentiary. Every brother went on a visit, took a flyer up there to educate a family, vote for Harold. Right. So we became conscious, so we start educating, right? And that takes courage, because you will have some that are, that's opposed to what you're trying to do, right? And out here, you got to have think with the courage. These ordinance, they need to have some courage to stand up to the mayor, whoever is going to take TIF funds allocated for their ward, right? And now they're using that TIF fund allocated for Lindale and Austin to build up downtown Chicago in the north side. You gotta have courage to speak up. Right? No matter it put you at all, it's the people put you at all. But at the same time, it's gonna take courage from the people to speak up and say, well, we didn't put you in office for that, man. You better but then the people gotta become conscious, we need to understand systems. We gotta educate ourselves. Right? And once you become aware, you gotta speak up. Right? I'm a convicted fella. Right? And I got tired of brothers and sisters talking about how they frustrated because they can't get a job because they're from the background or getting denied out of housing because they're from the background. So I called a meeting and about 47 convicted felons came together. I didn't have to worry about how they're going to look at me. I had to have the courage to say what I need to say. And I confronted them. We whining about what we can't do. 
But we ain't speaking for ourselves. We got ministers trying to speak on our behalf. They ain't never been to prison. You know, you got politicians trying to speak on our behalf, push a bill on our behalf. They ain't never been part of a street game. They ain't never hustled. They ain't never been a prison. We need to speak up for ourselves. Right? And so from that, we start forming what we call a voting block. Right? So I'm raising their awareness how we can empower ourselves where our power really lies. Right? How we need to fight for ourselves. Because see, those politicians can only survive off of votes. So if we take control, go back to the communities where we come from, and tap into those that's not voting, which is the convicted felon, the gang member, and register them to vote. Right? Start building a voting block and with their families and move these wannabe pretenders out the way that don't have the courage to speak up on our behalf. We need to put those in office that we feel got our best here. Maybe one of our own. Right? So it takes courage. And I get a lot of pot shots. When I go inside the prison, raise them inmates' awareness of the prison system is a system of domination. And under this system, the only vestige of manhood you can hold on to is dominate the weaker man. You ain't going to speak up against your condition with the administration you're afraid but you won't transfer it on each other and that caused a lot of tension among the inmates. Right? So when I speak up like that, right, guys get nervous. And what do I hear? Some of them guys like Ben and is a sellout. <laughs> he working with those people. Yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> I'm a stool pigeon. I'm working with the system now. I get a lot of that. But see, my courage come in when I hear this here, it's not hit one of them in the eye. And they mouth, shut up, sit down. Go, yeah, you forgot who I really am. But no, I got to remain who I become. I'm not that guy no more where I bust your head with a bat or strap up and gun you down. I ain't that guy no more. I got to have the courage to remain nonviolent. I deal with it every day. Going to these gas stations, young brothers blocking the doorway, and I got the bike, excuse me, let me buy, and they looking at who you think you're in, it triggers something in me. I got to buy what I got to buy, and go through the same thing on the way out, right? And take a moment to kind of raise their awareness on what they're doing and what it can lead to. And take the risk of them wanting to say something crazy out their mouth to me, threaten me, because I'm trying to interrupt their flow. But how many brothers in the community got the courage to talk to these young brothers? You got to have courage. Like Martin Luther King said, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people, not cowards. You got to have the courage to speak up. It, it takes courage to love a person. I can love my homies. And we walk down the street, he might want to holler at her sister, and she don't give him no rhythm, and now he want to disrespect her. I gotta have the courage to correct him, man. You brokers, man. That's just don't deserve that. But how many guys do that? You know. So it, it, it begins with raising awareness, becoming knowledgeable, right? And then now you educate others, bring light to what you know, and then have the courage and, and commit to follow through to bring about some changes. You can't be no poop butt. <laughs> can't be no coward. Right? I know as a vice lord, we believe in the five point star that represent the true essence of man. For every man seeking a love, true peace, freedom, and justice in his life. So what that means is I, I got to move and I got to interact with people with the spirit of love, with truth, freedom, and justice, right? And then I gotta stop allowing my physical cravings, my anger, my lust, my fear to control how I act and learn how to think as man and put mind over matter. But see, that's the part y'all don't hear about street gangs and our literature. But this is why I should teach brothers. If you're a vice lord and you believe in what we believe in, you can't allow your physical craving to control how you act and learn how to think as man and put mind over matter. But have a relationship with self. Recognize when you get a certain emotion, knowing how you think and with those thoughts, how you act. 
You got to reverse that because the open source is always getting killed, going to prison, in jail, or falling out with somebody, or letting your family down. So how do you turn that around? So it's raising awareness. But it's up to the individual to have the courage to make that change in their own lives. Does that make sense? I think your example of um, using gangs to apply positive social pressures or self-organize to prevent conflict are really exciting. Um, neighborhood-based organizations rather than like larger power structures. Do you think your example is something that could be applied in like the gang culture as it's described on a more decentralized basis? Right. If you look at the history, uh, uh, how many of y'all are familiar with the LSD movement in the 60s? Not the drug. <laughs> <laughs> LSD is vice lord was the L. Blackstone Rangers was the S, and the Disciples was the D. LSD, Law of Stones and Disciples. What they did in the 60s, they shut, like for example, the building of UIC. The Vice Lord shut that construction down and said, if you're not going to hire a black contractor, this building is not going up. And so the Blackstone Rangers on the south side came together with the vice lord, they start shutting construction down in Woodlawn. Then the disciples, and that formed LSD, where they was moving, because see, you had the civil rights movement, yeah, it's going on, but somewhere around 66, uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael said, we need black power, and that gave launch to the black power movement, which was a little different from the civil rights movement, right? And uh, Martin Luther King did not support the black power movement. This belief that if black people move and, and, and talk about black power, then it'll separate blacks from the uh, a larger group of people treated with injustice and, and oppressed people. And it'll separate blacks from them, so he didn't support the black power movement. But the black street gangs became part of the black power movement. And if you do the research on the vice laws, and, and this is one of their programs here, these are young vice lords. Because <coughs> the vice lords started their own self-help program. And they got that first grant to clean up their own neighborhood. So they hired a young vice lord to clean up their own neighborhood. Then they opened up on the corner of 16th and line there, uh, Teen Town, which was a restaurant. And then down the street they had the African Lion, where you could buy a lot of African preferred you know, like they had Afros back then, Afro picks, African jewelry, dashikis. Then they had two Tasty Freeze ice cream parlors. They had a group called Trag Tennis Rights Action Group where they was fighting a slum lords that were illegally evicting blacks out their homes. So the vice lords did a lot and then on the south side, the Stones and the Disciples split a million dollar grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, right? Uh, Bishop Brazier, the Woodlawn organization, they were the fiscal agent. Whereas on the west side, Sears and Roebuck was the fiscal agent for the vice lords. And uh, one of the first meetings they had, uh, August 27, 1967, right, I got newspaper clippers on all of this, right? Uh, they had a, 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 a conference, and, and, and they were supported by the two police commanders in Londale at the time. Londale has two districts in it, police districts, the 10th and 11th. And those two commanders met with the vice lords and the Egyptian Coles, who were the largest street gangs in that area. And they appealed to the police what they were trying to do. And the police helped them organize this conference where they invited Sears and Roebuck, Marshall Fields, Crafts, Food, Bell Telephone Company, before the day AT&T. All these companies, right, Ford Motor Company, Western Electric, and they brought all these companies together and appealed to them what they were trying to do to prevent these young vice lords, these young gang, these young people from going down that path that they had been down. And so out of that, that group became Operation Bootstrap. You know, Booker T. Washington concept, put yourself up by your own bootstrap. So they were doing for self. So they was able to, able to open up different uh, businesses and stuff. And when Martin Luther King came to Chicago, uh, Mayor Daly didn't want him there. He said he was a troublemaker. He said Martin Luther King comes to Chicago and agitate the relationship between blacks and whites in Chicago. 
So they put out a mandate that these black ministers shouldn't allow Martin Luther King to come and speak in their churches because they're giving access to the large black community because they all in church, right? And so Martin Luther King, when he came here, he moved his line there right on the north west corner of 16th and Hamlet. That's where he lived at. Try looking at this documentary called King and the Wilderness. It brings all that out to show him actually in there, cleaning up, to try and make this slum apartment livable for him and Coretta. And he did a lot of organizing out of Stone Temple Church, right off of Millard and Douglas Boulevard. Right? And when he did that speech down in Grant Park, right, Soldier Fields, right? Those were vice lords and stones and disciples that were. Not a lot of black people. The black ministers formed a coalition to, to prevent them from coming to their churches. Right? When he marched through Marquette Park, those were black stone rangers that marched with him. Yeah. When he marched through Cicero, those were vice lords that marched with him. But that history ain't going to be revealed to you. So street gangs, with the proper support, were able to bring down the violence in the community, start voting, Right, supporting each other and start putting in offers that have their best interests at heart. Right? That actually happened. And then what happened is America, they declared a war on street gangs when it was not necessary. Because by them organizing, it cut down the street violence and the crime in Londale and in Woodlawn and parts of Inglewood where the disciples were. But he declared a war because why? He saw them with the potential to rise up like the Irish did. Because those Irish street thugs, once they turned 18, 19, guess what happened to them? They became police officers. They got part of the fire department. Right? City jobs. That was their way to filter the young Irish street gangs into a life to control the politics of the city. Right. And they saw these black street gangs with the particular, they formed the coalition. Right. And that could happen today. <clears throat> but the biggest problem is, is my peers got to really understand that back in the 60s and the 70s, the street gangs were nations. You had the vice lord nation. And you had the disciple nation. There was a hierarchy. Right? A chain of command. That got disrupted through the efforts of law enforcement. Because why? They started looking at the street gang and started labeling them organized crime. The same tactics they used to bring down the American Mafia with the RICO Act, racketeering influence corrupted organization. That's what broke down the Mafia in this country, the Senate. Right? And they're using that same method on the street gangs. And so now you start seeing uh, gang leaders and high-ranking members of gang leaders getting charged by the RICO Act and going in the federal system and not the state system. Because what they saw in the 70s and the 80s, the leadership of street gangs was not on the streets. It was behind the wall. And that confused him. How could Larry Hoover, right, who left the streets as a black gangster disciple nation, go to prison in 1973 and organize and structure the gangster disciple nation from prison? And then it spilled up out in the community and they was controlled and a large percentage of the drugs coming to the city. And then they start raising the people to vote with that century, uh, 21st century vote organized and start raising awareness we need to move from gangster disciples to become broken in development. He showed a threat. So they hurry up, grabbed him out the state system, charged him up, and now gave him six life in the federal system, six life sentences. Jeff Ford ran the disciple, I mean the Stones, the movie become a Morris American, they became an L group, they started his own sect of the Muslim faith, right? They saw him moving into power, moving, shaking, and they get rid of him. Right? So the leadership was behind the wall, not on the street. Right? And so now these young people, they, they grow up without that structure, without that hierarchy. So they fend in the best way they can. So now you got cliques. 
you know, and these little guys don't see themselves as part of the nation. You know, I know back in my day, I was part of vice law nation. It was accountability. You know, you just couldn't break in somebody's house on our set. We challenged you. How you gonna break in that brother's house? You don't know that's one of our auntie's house, our grandmother's house. That act could cause conflict among us. And that's gonna lead to one of us hurting you. So a lot you don't break in houses around here. You you just rob somebody over there. That's, no man, you you don't know if that's his cousin or his auntie. And then when it comes out, it is. That's gonna cause conflict between you and him. And that, that, you know we don't need it. So shut that down. Right. So in a sense, we calm down a lot of violence and crime in our areas then because of that structure. Yeah, I was the chief of a branch of the vice law, but if I was doing something out of pocket, you can believe that how your architecture kept the law and Bible going and they came to visit me. What you doing over here, brother? Right? But see, that's been dismantled. Right? And it's law enforcement that did that. Instead of like, uh, we, were, we were young, and uh, I ended up in juvenile courts, and I had juvenile probation. And what did our probation <laughs> officer do? He had a shoe shine stand, a parlor. And he hired all of us that was on his probation to be his shoe shine boys. And they say that was patronizing people he worked with. He had to fire all of us. I ain't think before the years how every one of us ended up in juvenile prison. Yeah. But yeah, things like that got to happen. You know, instead of uh, us attacking them, you know, with this attitude, shutting down, you know, agitating them, you know, about to sit down and see, okay, how can we move up, up, up and <coughs> come to it? You know, it took a young brother maybe a year or so ago to come to me. He was part of the L, of the Alley Boys. They got the name Alley Boys because they sold drugs in the alley, right behind MacArthur. That's how they got the name Alley Boys, but they ain't a subgroup of the folk on losses. And they was at war with a group of vice lords called the Mafia Vice Lords. And he came to me and said, well, I don't like this. What can we do to stop this? And I said, well, let me see what I can do. You get them guys and gals to see if they're up to meeting with this group. Let them meet with this group, see if they be up to meeting with this group. And so we brought them face to face. And they agreed that they can't get no money. You know, they're hustling. They can't get no money. They shoot each other because the police don't shut them down. And then these guys are going to retaliate. So they just stop sliding on each other. That cut down the violence between them two. Then they, another guy said, well, you need to bring them jack boys in here. That's another group y'all be hearing about. Guys jacking people for their cars. There's a group called the jack boys. That's what they do. Jack people for their cars, right? And so they brought them in. They agreed. Then they brought the L block boys in. Right, then he brought the two feet books. So we brought nine clicks in my office and go back to courage. I knew them guys were gonna show up with pistols on them, with security cars out front. Cause just last week one of them shot the other or killed somebody. So then they gonna come without a gun. I knew that. So I had to have the courage to allow them to come meet in my place. Even though I know they were armed, and I understand why they were armed, to create this dialogue. And as time went on, they stopped carrying their guns in this meeting. They started dialoguing. An issue happened in the Austin community, they get on the phone. Hey, the brother just got killed over there, man. We need a meeting. You know? And they'll check it out. Who was involved? Is, is there some suspicious, suspicious stuff going on? Had they broke the treaty? Yeah, I come through there with that live thing, disrespecting those little mafia, causing tension with the younger guy. And they tell the young guy, shut it down, let us call a meeting. They track down who did it and let them look out and know y'all at home playing like y'all Facebook gangsters. Y'all really ain't out here and it's causing all this company. Y'all need to shut that down. So they came to an agreement. They would not use the social media to disrespect each other. This is the work that's going on in Austin right today. That's why Austin now is lower with the shootings than it was over a year ago, which was highest. But the police get the credit for it. We don't get noticed for that work. We don't get noticed for studying 
Last week, dude got killed over here, and one of their heads was locked up. Now he's home, and he might have an issue with how they dealt with it. He can reactivate a situation all over again. So we got to check him out. What's going on, man? You're home. Where your head at? So he won't disrupt what peace we done brought. We study this stuff. You know, so-and-so got killed last year and had balloons on this pole. His anniversary rolled around. They get drunk and they get to talking about what, what they should have did next. You know, they want to go do some revenge retaliation. We sit on that. We started this stuff. And this ain't coming from the Institute for Nonviolent Chicago for Reddit program. This is stuff we do because we're members of the community. And we all here to understand the dynamics of this here. And I ain't went to school to learn this. This is something I learned over the years on how to prevent young brothers from killing each other. But we had to make some sacrifices of our own lives. I done been shot point black in the jaw with a 38 with one of my own guys, drug related. I had to go to war with some of my own guys in the penitentiary. We went through all that, but we survived it. And so now that we're wiser, we gotta raise these young brothers away. And even my peers, man, you can't come to these little guys smell like alcohol and Blunts and all. How do you expect your little brother respect what you're saying? And just last week, you just cop some dope from him. You're not the message you bring. So I gotta raise these my peers' awareness, man. That's the way you gotta come to these little guys. They angry at us. We the men of the community, and we can't even protect them from the police checking them down, breaking and violating their Fourth Amendment right. And they look for us. We can't even protect them. How do you expect them to respect us? We don't have nothing in play to speak up for ourselves on their behalf. We can't even provide for them. We don't own none of the businesses in the community. Nothing like this here, right? But you expect them to respect you. So it's about raising awareness and educating. And then have the courage to speak up. I would advise this mayor and this new administration stop relying on information from those uh, usual suspects that have been given information on how the city should run. Go in these neighborhoods. Sit down with these people in the neighborhood. Sit down with a little guy that just come out of jail. Go in the jail and tell them officers, we just want to talk to them. We don't want to talk to your officers. We don't need you to take us on the tour and show us the best part of this county jail. We want to go on these decks and we want to hear from these little guys. Do you have a relationship with Norman Kirk? Who is yeah. Okay. We used to work with Cease Fire together. Good. Well, hopefully with him there, you know, with the relationship there, he'll be able to... Hopefully have the courage yeah. to remain, uh, trust me, Guys get in those positions and they say, well, you can't do this, 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 because you represent the city and guys want to keep that job and compromise their values. Hope he had the courage. You know, like when Mayor Day was in office, they tried to get me as the liaison with this reentry piece bill, convicted fellow. And they say, because I got to get this up, I got, I said, well, then this job ain't for me. But then they put another guy in there. He, we don't see him in the neighborhood. But he's speaking about what he's doing. We don't see it. I don't see you in none of me. I ain't never seen you on no site where the shooting happened. I ain't seen you at the gate when brothers coming out the penitentiary. Where'd you be? But you getting paid, writing some stuff, documenting. Where's your true research at? It ain't, it ain't on the block. I ain't seen you walk down Chicago Avenue, North Avenue, down Madison, 47th Street, 79th Street. I don't see you out there when you're doing research. On what? <laughs> Somebody else's stuff? Right? I'm always misquoted. They had me living in Cicero. I grew up on Cicero. <laughs> they had me living in Cicero. Yeah, they say I did 36 years in prison when it's the other way around. I've been out of prison 36 years. <laughs> yeah. Going by other people's stuff. Come talk to me. Yeah, that makes sense. Like I told uh, Superintendent uh, Johnson one time, I said, man, you know, these, your officers jump out on these guys on the block, throw them up against the walls and shake them down. Why don't they jump out on these guys after they left a meeting with some resources about a job fair going and pass these flies out to these little guys? 
Kind of make them look at the police a little different. You think you want to do that? No, I didn't want to do that. That ain't right. <laughs> we want to keep this fear. Yeah, they need to talk to some of the African American patrolmen. Need y'all familiar with African American patrolmen? Need go to the Chicago Historical Museum. They got a whole archive on black police officers in the '60s that were being discriminated against by the Chicago Police Department. And them black police officers band together and organized, and they sued the Chicago Police Department and won the suit. Yeah, that's who they are. Some of them guys are still around, Howard Sapper, Renaud Robinson, some of those guys are still around. As a matter of fact, Howard Sapper is a good person to talk to. He got an organization called Pat Positive Anti-Crime Trust. These are old veterans, and when I talk to young black police officers, are you familiar with African American Who would that? Come on, man, learn the history of what you're involved in. I learned the history of how vice versa. See, when vice versa came along, I was four years old, 1957, when they came into existence. I was four years old. I had to research the history, what I was about, so I could speak on, be effective in what I'm saying. So when I'm talking to young brother, I can educate them. You know, joining, we're all normalizing, and then gradually bring them into a new awareness. That's a technique. You know, normalize how they see things, educate them, and gradually bring them into a new awareness. And then they'll start seeing themselves different, and they'll see the world different, and they'll see themselves functioning in the world different. I had to go through that. I saw myself as a street hustler. That's what I felt I was limited to. And I saw the world as a street hustler. Everybody was a victim. <laughs> Pray. And I only saw myself functioning in the world as a hustler. And so some older guys started educating me on systems and impact and poverty and social disorganization, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and the strain theory about murder, right? It raised my awareness. So I started seeing myself different. I started seeing the world different. I saw seeing myself functioning in the world different. I had to arm myself. You know, Cause I was 32, never had a social security card ever in my life. Yeah, had never worked, had never completed. At 32, I wasn't even a citizen. Didn't even have a social security card. So you imagine me, 32 years old, sitting in a GED class, learning how to do fractions and multiplication, and these young kids in the class laughing at the question of the math, calling me pops. I'm gonna hit one of the little mars in the eye, and I don't want to get it out of the class. I had to suck it out of discipline my, just to get through this. But I had a support network, brother, encouraging to do that, man. I'm talking about these psychological blocking agents, you know, standing out in public with a white shirt on and a black tie with a resume up under my arm, looking like Ike Nickelback or somebody, because now I'm dressed like the guy I used to victimize, seeing like everybody that passed me, looking at me like I'm easy prey, and I want to take this towel and I can't handle this here, right? These the psychological barriers I had to go through making that transformation. My first job in the drug council was up in Evanston, Illinois. When they first told me to go up there, in my mind, Evanston is a rich white suburb. They're going to lock me up soon as I get off there. <laughs> I ain't going there. You know, false information. And then when I went up there, they hired me as a drug counselor. I'm sitting in this meeting. I'm a counselor, and they're discussing cases using all these clinical terminologies. You know, this client's from a maladaptive behavior. This one has impaired social skills. In my mind, I want to say something like, you know, all that mom got to do is bust that out of the game. He can be straight. But you can't use slang in a professional setting. So I would leave work every day feeling so inferior, incompetent, giving myself the message I don't belong here. Those are psychological blockages that people don't research on. Don't talk about it. Right? I was ready to quit. But where can I go? Back in my little box that I've been in with high school dropouts, gangsters, thieves, hookers, <laughs> drug dealers. But now here I find myself outside the box around people speak with good diction, pursuing careers, and I'm feeling income. I'm ready to go back in my box where it's comfortable. But it took peers to normalize what I was experiencing outside the box, because they went through it. They gave me what I needed to hold fast. So I was able to get the GED. I was able to become a certified drug abuse counselor, get the social degree in mental health and substance abuse, get the bachelor's in inner city studies, get the master's in leadership development and education. Even when I was in my master's program, 
I felt everybody in that class was more educated than me. And I withdrew. I come to class every day ill-prepared to give myself the message I should quit a bachelor's is okay. These psychological blockages. But because I had a support network to check in with, they gave me what I needed. Man, why don't you start doing the research? Studying the material. I started doing that and I came back. I was able to engage in the dialogue in the classroom. And come to find out I had more life experience than all them students. And they started calling on me for things. And it gave me a sense of self-worth and my esteem built and uh, end up with my master. Then I had the nerve, right? Uh, I was speaking at Northeastern on games and, uh, and the, the professor invited me to teach at the class on games and you know, our students do these evaluation, my name here come up after I got my degree. They said, hey, you thought about teaching? My poor self image, no, I ain't qualified to teach. They said, well, we got a class on the Chicago games history. We like you to try to teach. Cool. And I taught that class. And they gave another class. It was a criminal behavior. Introductory criminal justice, prison reentry systems. I don't need a textbook to teach those classes. But yeah, I cooperate with the institution and got some texts and some theories from other people and look at the contrast, how I reverse, how they do it. And now I'm a professor at Northeastern Illinois University. 